Catherine and I both work at the Australian Council for Educational Research. Um, we do a lot of assessments um, about student performance. We also have a lot of professional resources to help teachers and school leaders. Um, and But this work falls under the research section. And um, it was actually, uh, we, we applied for funding from the um, Campbell collaboration. It, you know, every now and again, the collaboration um, puts out calls for um, for suggestions for projects, and we responded to one of those. And um, uh, yeah, we're very I'm happy to receive this funding. So th uh, thank you very much again for for that support. Um, so yes, it was quite a big um, team that we had, um, and. Um, the, uh, there are also um, some researchers from other universities, um, but the main people working on it were from, from ACR. Um, now, the um, just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. So it, um, a bit of the background in terms of the central concepts, why did we do this um, methodology? And then I'll hand over to Catherine for the results. And as we've heard the questions, please, um, to the end. Thank you. Um, now, wh why did we look at what we looked at? <laughs> um, well, obviously, um, ASD and, and uh, that whole spectrum um, of uh, disabilities um, is quite has got quite um, large prevalence. Um, so it's estimated that in the US it's about one in 59 children, school aged children in Australia about one in 150. Um, and of those, it's estimated that about 40 to 50 percent mm -hmm. have um, anxiety issues. Now, anxiety per se is nothing negative. A little bit of anxiety, like we all have also when doing these presentations, is good. Um, however, if it interferes with um, the person's ability to function normally, then uh, that's when it becomes a problem. And um, so, and because more and more of children who have been diagnosed with ASD um, join join mainstream schools. That's why we were interested in looking at interventions or at strategies that um, help those children to actually reduce the anxiety in um, real life context, we called it. So either at home or at school. Um, so we excluded um, any pharmaco purely pharmacological interventions. Um, because we wanted to um, focus on things that could be done without drugs, <laughs> basically. Um, so where where the intervention um, deals with, you know, providing the children with strategies, um, like you know, um, calling on 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 people to help them when they feel the anxiety coming up, or um, strategies like um, going and having um, um, some physical activity um, or Re, um, or um, go back to a safe place or something, um, listen to some relaxing music. So we, you know, we were looking at those sorts of um, um, strategies. Um, yeah, um, now with the, um, our actual review research question was, what is the relative effectiveness of interventions for managing anxiety of school aged children with ASD that have been used in school, family, and clinical settings. Um, and yes, um, we refer to clinical settings, but ultimately the intention of the intervention had to be to help these children at school or um, at home, so in their day-to-day -day life settings. Mm -hmm. um, so the study design, um, so like with every, Good systematic reviews, and like the other presenters have have uh, also shared, um, part of what takes um, a long time <laughs> is to actually um, go through well, which criteria do we apply, and how do we apply them for actually um, considering studies um, to be included in the review. So, as we said, we wanted um, to focus on mainstream school age children. Um, that had been diagnosed with ASD by a professional. 
um, and we're also experiencing anxiety symptoms, um, again, um, by, by, uh, by a professional. The interventions, as I said, um, um, no, not uh, we excluded anything that was purely pharmacological um, and, um, yeah, uh, had applied to real world world settings and the outcome that had to be measured because that was um, you know the, the the primary outcome for evaluating the effectiveness of the intervention um, had to be anxiety and again it had to be measured by some uh, uh, by some instrument or diagnostic interview and just to highlight here already that um, these studies, uh, the, the outcomes could be either a self-report by the student um, or these checklists that teachers or parents or clinicians um, get to use. So those were the criteria for inclusion. Um, and these were all the databases we searched. Um, the Australian Council for Educational Research has um, as part of the Cunningham Library. We are still in the lucky position to actually have, as part of our staff, a, a trained um, and, and well-experienced librarians. So Jenny Trevitt um, did all the, um, the systematic searching, um, which is, of course, um, a real help in studies like this, because they are um, across all the thesauri of all these databases and can really um, give us good advice in terms of how to search. Um, search time frame was between 96 and 2018. Um, and in addition to the databases, we also um, went to some great literature, literature sources. Um, now we followed the um, usual PRISMA um, methodology where as usual, you start with a lot of, not, not quite your, who started with 150,000, <laughs> not, not quite. <laughs> so we only started with about three and a half thousand um, and another 170 additional records. So removed duplicates and then we screened titles and abstracts, um, excluded a couple of thousand based on that they either hadn't didn't have an intervention for managing anxiety or um, there were some shortcomings in terms of either the measurement of ASD or the measurement of the anxiety. Um, and we came across a lot of um, uh, sort of books and guidelines rather than actual interventions. Um, so we then ended up with um, 119 uh, articles for which we extracted the full text. Um, and again, out of those, 95 were excluded. You can see um, the reasons um, for, for, for that there. As, as everyone who has ever done a systematic review knows, um, you can only give it your best shot based on the abstracts, but then often you know, they will be silent on whether or not or how they um, uh, operationalize some of the central concepts. So anyway, um, as a result of that, we actually ended up with 24 studies, which we then included in the quantitative synthesis. Um, and by the way, coming back to the first speaker, um, this was originally designed as a mixed method um, systematic review. However, based on feedback on the protocol, we decided um, that we would um, only stick to the quantitative um, aspect of the study. And, and even then, um, uh, it, it was a lengthy process and um, certainly uh, certainly worthwhile, but with all the systematic reviews, um, a lot of, um, yeah, a, lo a long process, but, but good in terms of the robustness of results um, and the publication that comes out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just in terms of the data analysis, um, we did an assessment of risk of bias in the included studies. Catherine will talk about that in the results. Um, we, in terms of the measurement of treatment effects, um, in the overall analysis, because remember I said that there are three outcome groups that we considered, um, parents, teachers or clinicians and students. Um, we gave in the overall results, um, we gave preference to clinician reports because we 
um, considered them to be more reliable um, than, than the other reports. Um, in terms of units of analysis, um, with the non-standard designs where you have some crossover of um, groups, we only use the first measurement to avoid having um, them in there twice. Um, in terms of the assessment of heterogeneity, we use the standard chi-square um, analysis. And because of the type of um, studies we had, we use the random effects meta-analysis. Um, and Catherine, <laughs> you know, um, Judith, I think when he said um, that uh, uh, you needed um, um, a specialist statistician, well, that was Catherine in our project. So she did all the um, hard yards with the actual analysis. Um, and then the data synthesis approach, as I said, the three um, outcome uh, groups plus overall. And then in addition to feedback that we got when we first submitted the results, we also then included a moderator analysis because some of the interventions um, involve family um, and others do not. And um, some of the interventions are focused on individual um, uh, children and others do it in, 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 in groups. Small groups, often only three, uh, three um, uh, children attending, but groups nevertheless. So um, we had a look at the differential effectiveness of those um, settings or situations. And then uh, we also did some um, sensitivity analysis where we removed um, bigger studies um, to see whether effect of outliers or on the effectiveness estimates of the interventions. Mm -hmm. Um, so then, 24 studies uh, were in the uh, final results. Um, we had a spread, uh, so some uh, in Australia, in the US, UK, and Singapore, Thailand, and the Netherlands, one each. Um, most studies had a randomized waitlist control design, and um, six of the studies were classified as quasi experimental designs, so not, not as robust, but, um, but still met, meeting the criteria for inclusion. Um, participants, um, a total of nearly a thousand across all the studies, and yeah, a, as a reflection of the prevalence of um, ASD, um, there are far more uh, male students than female students. Um, and um, yeah, as I said before, uh, school age, so six to 16, that was sometimes a little bit of an issue because the intervention actually went down to um, lower than that and um, higher than that age, but um, we tried to focus as much as possible on that age. Um, now, in terms of disability, we, um, there, there had to be a certain level of, well, while we didn't do a check for, um, you know, some of these intervention do for IQ, um, there, there had to be a certain level of um, individuals' verbal IQ because, you know, in, in a lot of the studies um, required self-assessment, self-reporting of the students on their levels of anxiety. So they had to have a certain level of verbal functioning. Um, now, 22 of these studies that we found um, were a CBT intervention. The two that were not, one was uh, a theater, um, theater based intervention, and the other one was a Thai massage intervention. So um, they were a little bit different. Um, outcome measures, um, as I said, they were um, different, um, but validated, previously validated outcome measures, um, mainly checklists. Um, yeah, and now I think I'm going to hand over to Catherine. Oh, there you go. So uh, through the systematic review, as Petra sort of indicated, we have lots of different results, but we just, we'll just show one as a sort of bit of an example today. Um, here's our lovely forest plot, and you can see this is the overall one. So it's got the 24 articles included, um, including the child front uh, article at the top uh, that had quite a high effect size. Um, 
So you can see that overall uh, we had a uh, strong effect of 0.83 uh, in favour of the, the treatment um, and all but one of the studies uh, was actually in favour of the treatment group. Um, you can also see we've included the risk of bias um, down the right hand side there and that for example um, risk C which is the performance bias um, blinding of participants and personnel um, which is quite standard uh, in these types of studies where it's impossible to, block, to blind participants. They know whether they're uh, involved in, a, in, in the treatment or not. So, um, yeah, what the, that's sort of unescapable. Um, but otherwise, um, we preferenced um, the clinicians' reports when it was in this overview, overall um, snapshot, um, just to give a really clear insight as to what was going on. You can also see um, that the anxiety measures used in the studies. So the study um, coding there is the first four letters of the author, the year, and then uh, uh, another letter at the end that refers to the actual measures used. So you can see that, um, you know, there was the scared, the PARS, the, um, you know, different types of measures uh, that are quite standardised um, and well used, um, you know, internationally. So we were really strong on making sure that anxiety was appropriately assessed uh, and also um, diagnosis of autism was appropriately assessed. And a lot of the studies did get thrown out because they didn't have that real strict um, measurement of and robust measure of, of anxiety. Um, some of the other things we looked at um, in terms of the groupings, uh, sorry, the moderator uh, analysis. So we looked at, as you might remember, Petra said, um, we looked at interventions with families and compared them to interventions that uh, just had the students by themselves and the interventions with families were had much stronger effect. So they had an effect size of 0.74. Um, uh, compared to 0.6 um, for students on their own. Um, the groupings also had a, a quite different effect as well. So if students were involved on a one-to-one -one basis in the treatment, um, they had an effect size of 1.24, which is very large, um, compared to something quite small, which is only 0.37 for those group-based interventions. So, so there were differences there. And there are also differences in terms of the actual report, you know, reporters themselves. Um, clinician reported outcomes in terms of the impact um, was even higher than what we've got here. Um, it was 0.84. Uh, and this is with the outlier removed. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the parent reported outcomes um, involved 19 studies and they had a an effect size of 0.53 uh, and student reported outcomes that involved 17 studies um, had a outcome of 0.35. So you can see, um, you know, it went from quite high strong outcomes down to moderate outcomes getting down to quite low outcomes, um, which shows the, the breadth of variability just on the basis of who's reporting you know, the impact, um, which is something obviously to keep in mind. Um, me, we did do a... Starting to run out of time. And I want yep, to make yep, sure we're just about there. Yeah, we're maybe there. So, so the funnel plot, you can see um, that um, Chalafant is clearly an outlier. Uh, and so in those sensitivity analysis, we removed those. So those, those values that I was reporting were, was with those outliers removed. Um, and summary of results. So basically, we found that the psychoeducational psycho interventions for anxiety, which were predominantly cognitive-based therapies, um, were found to improve anxiety symptoms. Um, on average, uh, an effect size of 0.7 after that outlier was removed, um, having you know, a positive impact on the mainstream school-aged children with autism. And um, we found that it was ultimately reducing the number of diagnoses of anxiety disorder for some of those participants. So that was a very positive outcome. 
Um, just to note again that most of the studies that were included were CBTs um, and, you know, the quality of the evidence um, was quite good, it was moderate. Um, the effectiveness of inter interventions was generally stronger for clinicians, um, but reports were lower amongst parents and self-reported measures. So in conclusion, there is evidence that CBTs is an effective and behavioural treatment for anxieties in some children and youth with autism without co-occurring intellectual disabilities. The evidence for other psychoeducational interventions is more limited. It's not just due to the popularity of CBTs, but also due to the quality of the small number of non-CBT studies available. And that's it from Australia. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. We're happy to have questions at the end. Thank you.